I'm Gene, and this is Perfect Flow. I'm a New Zealand-based athlete and coach focused on optimizing performance, health, and well-being. While I have a professional background in biomedical engineering, I've chosen to follow my more immediate passions for running, endurance, adventure, movement, nutrition, lifestyle, community, psychology, and personal growth. My goal in starting this podcast is to connect with bright minds to extract the information I need to live a life that makes sense and feels good, and share those conversations with others. Apart from your favorite podcast app, the best places to follow my work are perfectflow.nz, genebeverage.nz, and perfectflow on Facebook. Hey, welcome back to Perfect Flow. So today I'm talking with Oscar Spetz. He was one of the runners for Oko Linnea, the team that won Teo Mila just over a week ago. And uh, yeah, he's a a young Norwegian who's uh, living in Uppsala and uh, has a lot to share about how the team uh, prepared for uh, this year's uh, big relay and how the the night unfolded. And we also take a look at uh, his GPS tracking. So uh, it's... If this is useful to use the video uh, for the last third, I think um, just a bit of a primer on Teo Mila for those who are not uh, that familiar. Maybe some of the younger listeners in New Zealand, uh, Teo Mila is a 10 person relay and it starts at dusk. So uh, the you can see some some great starting images of Teo Mila and also Eucala. Uh, on YouTube with a uh, huge field uh, starting together, mass starting out into the forest and uh, it gets gets dark fairly quickly once you get into the trees and then most of the, the legs are run at night time and as you'll hear Oscar say just the last couple are during the, the dawn uh, in, in daylight again so it's an, an incredible experience and something that if you are uh, interested in orienteering long term is, is definitely a bucket list race to do and it's it's not just an elite competition like uh, some of the other representative races it's it's really there are um, a huge number of teams like runners at all different levels uh, in in the clubs over in uh, Sweden and Scandinavia will enter teams uh, in these races and um, they get out there and uh, the elite guys have their competition, and it's and everyone else is, is still starting, starting together. It's one massive race, so uh, it's cool. And uh, yeah, I, I think this is a really cool chat. Um, it's really cool to connect again with the orienteering season, uh, which I guess has kind of been on the back burner uh, for those of us who have been away from Europe for the last two years. So um, it's cool to get excited uh, about these races and know that I'll be able to uh, take part soon as well uh, as uh, many others will. And as we've just started seeing with uh, um, Penelope Salmon and Tim Robertson uh, doing some really good performances in uh, Europe in the uh, past few weeks. So yeah, get excited and uh, have a listen to some uh, really interesting uh, commentary about orange sharing and uh, racing these big relays. Thanks for coming on Perfect Flow. Yeah, uh, thanks for anyone. Really cool. Cool. I'm, I'm not sure if any of the others are going to make it, so we'll get uh, right in. Yeah. And yeah, if they if they um, turn up, that's cool. Uh, so you're with Orko Linnea, and um, maybe you could give a little bit of background about uh, the club, where it is, and how you got into orienteering. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, Orko Linnea is a um, club based in Uppsala, in Sweden, a little north of uh, Stockholm, uh, maybe one hour drive or something. And it's not that old club. Um, I guess it was like in 1995 or something that's the club was uh, yeah it was two club that got into one here in Uppsala um, but it's a big club uh, I think it's the biggest club in Sweden actually with over a thousand members um, so yeah a lot of kids and uh, elite athletes and yeah older people doing orange drink so uh, a really big club um, and for me I got into orienteering as a really young age, uh, both my parents doing orienteering, so I uh, 
haven't had the, the choice actually I would say <laughs> I was just yeah going into the sport just yeah uh, uh, the whole my li- the whole life I think and I can't really remember uh, my childhood without orienteering and like from six seven years I was running by myself and doing orienteering races all the weekends and doing these uh, summer races and competitions in more southern Europe in in the summer that's my summer memories uh, and uh, yeah just uh, got many friends and thinking that I, I was okay in it and just uh, training more and more and I got to Sweden to yeah be a, become more like an elite elite athlete in in orienteering mm-hmm. so you're not originally from uh, Sweden or Uppsala No, I'm from uh, Norway in Trondheim and lived there for 20 years and then I came to Uppsala for yeah, almost three years ago, uh, the summer 2019 when I was uh, last year uh, junior. And so I decided to move here because I was tired of the snow in Trondheim, it's like snow the whole winter and I was yeah, really tired of not running any orienteering in the forest before team Mila and and I, w- I would also do something else and like, Trondheim has a big orienteering environment for students but I was a little tired of the, the city and wanted to do something new and Uppsala felt like they had the good terrains and good runners and a good training environment so then I came You're not the only one to take that move to Uppsala there's actually a lot of people have have moved there maybe you can just use the uh, Tio Mila team as an example where I the, where are the different um, people of that team from? Yeah, uh, we were actually seven nationalities on the team. Um, and I think everyone has been in Uppsala. Maybe not Luca, actually, but everyone else has been in Uppsala for some time. Um, Rito doing the first leg from Switzerland. He was here last uh, autumn. And then we have Milos from Czech Republic, who was here some years ago and is a big part of the club. And you have these, uh, the OGs, I would call them, the Swedes, with uh, Rasmus and Uppe and, and Albin, who have been in the club for over 10 years, and Albin have been in the club whole his life. So, um, But then you also had like me and Lucas, who came to Uppsala three years ago to develop further uh, or in tears, and Janis Bonek have been in the club for like eight, nine years, since he was like 14 years old, to have a Scandinavian club and he has also been doing high school in, in Sweden and Uppsala and uh, Rasmus Mölies the same he has also been been there for a long time he's from Denmark and and then you have Luca who just uh, I don't think he have lived in Uppsala but, but he has been here sometimes and he's a good friend of, of the OGs so I think that's the reason he, he came to the club Yeah I think there's some kind of effect once uh, some talent starts to group in, in a certain place and then they do some traveling and make friends that are also quite talented and you can see this uh, kind of effect of the talent all, all congregating together and then maybe in 20 years time that the talent goes somewhere else but you're definitely riding a wave at the moment uh, in Uppsala it looks um, really cool and I've experienced that a little bit I've, yeah. I've been to Uppsala a few times and uh, yeah, it, it is. It is really encouraging um, to come from somewhere like New Zealand, where there isn't quite so um, much consistent training, and then to go somewhere like Uppsala, where uh, there's always training on. Uh, once once the snow is gone, the season starts, and uh, yeah, the energy is really cool. So I'm not surprised that those people uh, want to get involved. How many times have you done Tio Mila? And I guess maybe you can lump nuclear and with this but what do those races mean to the club it's not something that's obvious to uh us here in new zealand and um, many of my listeners mm, yeah uh for swedes and and, and norwegians the the relays are are big and there's something that's talked about the whole the whole winter training and the first time i ran team i was like when i was 14, then I get, did the yacht relay, and then I ran the scenery relay my first time when I was 16, so in 2005-15, I think. Um, 
and you, you already from then feels like this is this is uh, a big thing and it's talked about a lot and I also yeah my both my parents are in cheers and I, I ask my father a lot about the team Mila and he has run Tila Mila for Bekelage he has never like won team Mila but one of my biggest goal for this year was to beat his personal best with like a sixth place or something so it really means a lot uh, just like uh, for me personally but also like in in the club um, and in Freddy, my home club in Norway uh, we always talked a lot about it but we never had like a big uh, or a good team um, in the in the men's or women's class um, but when I came to Uppsala and, and the NEM, my, my goal was to run for for a team and to perform uh, on the on the first uh, team and oh uh, yeah I uh, saw when I came that this really means not just for the first team but for the whole club it was important um, and it's like every Tista Spana we have this uh, Tista Soppa and it's just Team Mila uh, you're talking with everyone and you're talking Team Mila with uh, all the guys in the sauna that have run Team Mila 40 times and yeah, I think it's Team Mila uh, all over the place the whole winter, actually. Um, and then Jukola as well, you're talking something about it, but it's Team Mila that's in focus, and I guess Jukola it's more focused on now. And I guess that's because of the tradition uh, in Sweden. And if you go to a club in Finland, I guess it's Jukola uh, they are talking a little more about. But um, both the relays are a big focus in in uh, the training environment and on the daily basis, I would say. Yeah, I love how inclusive these relays are. From New Zealand, there seems to be a focus on world champs because no one really goes over to Europe to run Tio Mila, so it's off the radar. And mm. people think that it's just like world champs or nothing. And then a few people from New Zealand run World Cups and their different countries can bring more people. So it's actually a bit bigger. World Cup is probably harder than uh, World Champs because there's more people. But then things like Ukula and Tio Mila are just a whole other level. Like yep. all, the, all the top runners from all of the clubs are there. And you could see uh, last week the, the posts on social media, how happy some of the, the top runners who you're used to seeing getting medals at WOC are uh, so happy to be in the top 10 with their, with yep. their teams. And there's 10 people running each leg. So, you know, there's already like 100 people in the top 100, you know, and people are really happy with that. So it's just a whole nother level how many uh, top orienteers are all there together. So um, I thought we could talk a little bit about the build up this year. Was yep. there anything um, different, different that happened? Um, how does it compare to different years? And yeah, you mentioned it's like the first big race of the season. So there was a long time to think about it over winter. Yeah. yeah. How, how, how is it working for you this year? Uh, yeah, we can, we can start with uh, that. I came to Uppsala two years ago. And um, the, yeah, as we all know, COVID came um, for yeah uh, that winter. Uh, so I haven't had the possibility to run any team Mila for Linnea uh, before this year. And yeah, had we just did a lot of trainings, and what's actually nice that Thierry was living in the town, making a lot of trainings during that time. Um, but um, then Yukula came last year, and uh, we did some really, yeah, maybe not bad races, but we didn't perform well as a team. Uh, and like everyone was maybe underperforming a little bit, and when everyone was doing that you can't get the results um, and we also was l maybe a little unprepared uh, Yukla came like in the end of the summer and we hadn't seen each other for a long time and it was not uh, the focus of the club I would say uh, so after Yukla uh, last year we yeah we said okay we have to we have to change our attitude and have to do something and we also had a lot of new guys in the team uh, a younger guys like this year we was like Five of the guys was 24 or 23 years old, and if you see on the team that was running like four years ago, uh, more of the older guys were running. So we had like to learn uh, our our younger guys to run a relay on the on the yeah the 
the best way, uh, I would say. So mustering was uh, in the head of like this is a relay project we had, and we had also a lot of relay trainings. But I think the most important part was that we had like these meetings discussing how we should act when doing relays, tactics, uh, yeah, mental preparation, I would say. Um, and we had this uh, maybe one one time uh, once in a month. Uh, every month um and yeah doing different scenarios and talking yeah i think that made us feel like everyone was prepared uh, for the relay and then it was like yeah training all the winter and doing this kind of stuff um, and for me personally it was i had like one goal and that was to to be on the first team and it was hard it was uh, we have like three four guys Five, five guys maybe that was uh, fighting for the last spots um, and from I think the Mawson relay in the middle of Mars or something or end of the Mars uh, every every weekend was like uh, races that uh, uh, was deciding if you are not on the team or in the team and so for me personally it was like every weekend was important even if Team Real was the first important race I had to perform every weekend to to earn my spot, I would say. Um, but that, that also made us, or made me uh, feel safer when I was uh, standing on the start line because I'd like doing five relays before the team Mila and doing some relay trainings and, and so on. So I think the preparation was really good. And, and when we, uh, we stood at the start line, I think everyone was feeling that, okay, we know we know what we're gonna do. We had a really uh, strong focus about doing these ninety percent uh, uh, races, not like hundred percent, because um, yeah, Albin had some uh, input on one of these meetings that he saw that it's not like doing the best leg times in Team Mila that's winning the relay. It's like uh, not uh, doing most mistakes and. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, maybe the biggest guys uh, on the team, like those who are running rock and some uh, those kind of races, have been maybe underperforming a bit because they're maybe taking too uh, too big risk when they are racing. Like they are used to doing these hundred percent races, so we had a lot of lot of focus on doing these ninety percent races, and then the and then the last leg have to do like a hundred percent race, but. If we could do nine legs with 90%, we, we will hopefully be in the lead. And we had a big focus on that. And um, I think... Yeah, there's two really that. interesting things there. Mm. That, that that 90% is really interesting and something that you know, definitely differs to like World Champs and, and World Cups where people are going full risk uh, for a medal because 10th um, is going to be disappointed disappoint disappointing them if they have a chance to get on the podium. Yep. Um, but with 10 people in a relay, um, getting through that without uh, any one runner having having a nightmare out there uh, is, is yeah definitely hard enough. And um, I, I am, yeah, not super surprised that you go for 90%, but quite impressed that you managed to pull that off given the, mm. the pressure on the day. Like it sounds good in theory, but then once the start gun goes to actually um, be able to execute on that uh, plan of just not losing the race, every every runner and every leg just not losing the race, uh, that is a lot easier said than done. Um, and I wanted to go back uh, a little bit further. Um, you were talking about the, the pressure uh, that you were noticing in uh, the races before um, Tia mm. uh, Yeah, I, th I think, what's the psychology of that um, like compared to um, like that first race of the season? Is, is that the most nervous one? And then once you get lots and lots of racing going, you're just a lot more comfortable hitting the start line under that pressure. Is that something you've noticed? Yeah, I, I would maybe say that. I would like on the first relay that I mentioned the... Uh, uh, some minutes ago and the Mawson relay that was my first relay doing the first team uh, of Linné uh, we hadn't the, the best like 
Rasmus Andersson was running on the second team just to give like me and Rasmus Möller the experience to run on the first team. But that night I was so nervous, like much more nervous than I was uh, before Team Mila, I would say. And that was just a, a little competition in 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 Sweden. Like okay, it was hundred teams or and four legs, but but uh, it doesn't uh, mean anything in in the end. Um, but I was really nervous. Uh, it was my first time at Linné, uh first team, so um, I would say that when I done that relay and I, I did okay and then I did some more relays and I did yeah okay I did some mistakes and then we had like some individual races that also went okay I felt like when I was at the start line on team Mila, I felt prepared uh oh, yes I was really nervous before team Mila as well but I think if you'd said to me one year ago that okay you're gonna run in the first team of Linné and team Mila, I would say okay I'm gonna shit my pants the uh, couple hours before but but uh, that really didn't, didn't happen and then I would say that that was because I felt and the whole team felt really prepared and, and calm when we were having the last uh, team meetings and so on um, so yeah, yeah one of the things I've learned o- over the years um, and this applies quite a lot for those that uh, with the travel is a bit more expensive like those in New Zealand and Australia and some of the other countries that are further away is that we can do the, the running time, we can be really fit, and we can do the orienteering hours also on paper, it looks really good. But then when we get get over to whatever races we're doing in Europe, it's the pressure that we haven't prepared for. We haven't actually ticked that box. We haven't done five big races leading up uh, to our goal race with big fields and mm. Um, and a club who's who's watching you, you know, pressure, external pressure, um, mm. weighing on you, and I I think that's something that we've all underestimated. Uh, yeah, so that's just so yeah, tip tips for younger people: uh, definitely get the running distance and get the get your controls in each week, get your hundred controls in. But also, yeah, you've got to get some um, high pressure races in, yeah. and you have to get that that nervousness out of the way on these smaller races. Otherwise you just, yeah, you shoot your pants t- two hours before the biggest race of your season that you haven't done a, a, a whole lot of racing leading into it. So yeah, I thought that was a great point. Yeah. Maybe tell us um, a bit about got, okay. the legs at Tia Miller. What are mm-hmm. they, how, how are they um, structured? Because they're not all the same. And is there some strategy? about building the team or is it just the best runners do the most controls basically uh no i think team has a lot of strategy and also that it's like 10 legs uh that's it that is more strategy strategy than a nuclear i would say um and this year the long night uh, was at the fifth leg um the last year so it had been on the fourth leg and uh, so what's more important or you can't you can't win uh, Team Mila before the long night, but you can really lose it. And um, so, explain the long lot. night for, for those people because it's a it's a term that we all understand, but uh, maybe the young mm. ones don't know the importance of the long night. The long night is is the biggest or the longest uh, leg on Team Mila. Uh, it's always like ninety to hundred minutes. This year it was hundred minutes, and it's uh, unfort. It not said that it should be unforked but it, I think it's been unforked since like 2007 or something so it's like a tradition that is unforked nowadays um, but it's always like if you're doing 100 minutes or orienteering and forked you will get some groups and if a group goes faster than another one it can be huge time differences uh, so if you're not in the leading pack or something on uh, the long night you can be like 20 minutes behind when during the last uh, legs of the relay, and it you can't catch that. Um, so, um, like for me, my Norwegian club, Freddy, who we have been fighting for like top 40 uh, some years, it's always like uh, doing the best guys before the long night, uh, because you you want to be as as uh, yeah. Um, have the bag, best pack in in the long night, and if if you're not, uh, and then we always have like maybe some weaker guys on some 
more important legs at the end, but then the time differences are, are so big, so you can't lose so many spots in the end, actually. And, and yeah, so the long night is like the, what you can call it, the king leg of the, of the relay. So it's really important to put your fastest runner on, on that leg. Is that what happens? Or is it the person who maybe, not maybe the isn't the, the most consistent, but someone who can hold on to the pack? Yeah, it's. I think it's a big difference between the teams as well. Um, like uh, Linné and some other of the top teams, we can pet uh, someone who are really good and and can orienteer. But there are also like maybe some teams that maybe are like just outside top 10 or top 20 and so on that are uh, risking more and putting like some guy that are really good in in running but maybe can't orienteer that much and and hopefully they hope that he can get a good pack or something but if they are not in a good pack onto the long night they maybe gonna lose even more minutes because they have uh, taken that risk and that's uh, really yeah you can see the strategy uh, between the teams and if you also watch the long night, you can see that it's always like one or two guys that are uh, in front of the groups and everyone else are just following and having a really hard time. And, but we had like Lucas Leland and he's really, really, really strong and, and was the leader of the big train on this long night. So, yeah. And what about the other legs? Can you contrast them to the long night? What are the shortest ones? Yeah. Um, this year it was a really a lot of shorter legs, I would say. Uh, I think that the terrain was tougher than it had used to be on the team level, and that was uh, one of the reasons. Uh, but in the start, it's like always just important to to don't lose uh, too much time uh, to the lead, but you don't need to to be in the lead. Just that you are uh, not too far far away behind out in the long night, I would say. And then after a long night, uh, this year it was some really uh, shorter legs um, that was supposed to be like more middle distance legs. And those are the, um, the legs that I've, have been uh, deciding uh, team in the last couple of years when EF Corp have been putting out Högström and, and Vettler Ud and Jens Wengdan and those really good technical guys on the night and that have been... Uh, running away from from the pack when uh, maybe the other teams have had to put their weakest weakest spots uh, on the team in the team. They have had maybe the safest cards and and have made like uh, some gap. Uh, but this year they they had or the lake was maybe not that uh, decisive. It was maybe some easier orienteering than expected, especially in the part, uh, the first part. Um, and then the three last uh, legs uh, are also really important. But the eighth leg this year was unforked. So I also think that a lot of teams um, had some difficult level, uh, different level uh, on the on the runners there. Um, like you see, we saw EFK putting world champion Casper Foster there, and like uh, some other teams, maybe like Kove had their weakest guy uh, on that on that leg um, and then uh, the two last legs is always the most important or there Th those legs are the decisive one and that was also what we were talking about that uh, before these uh, those two legs it's like 90 percent but to win the relay you need to have maybe more than 90 percent on those last legs uh, and then you also need uh, yeah world-class runners uh, like we had on the two last spots there. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, how did uh, you decide? How did the team decide on where, where to put uh, which runners, and what was the the chosen format? Mm. I think I think uh, people maybe got a little surprised when seeing our setup um, because Linné have had like some experience with uh, doing some mistakes at the beginning and really and because of that never managed to get back in a relay um, and be be there out on a long night and and then you're you're feeling like you never you never been into really into the relay uh, already in the start um so we had like more a tactic that 
we felt that we had we had the runners that we could save it up a little. Uh, so we put uh, Milos on the second leg, and uh, that was uh, a shorter leg, and he was maybe like a little over qualified uh, for that leg. But that was just to secure that if we did some mistake on the first leg, and I would if I had would uh, do the second leg, it was a bit it would have been hard harder for me to maybe catch up five minutes or something. But if we had Milos there, we knew that okay. But then we can get back into the pack if we if something happens and if we are in the lead, Milos can just keep it going and keep it going. And I think it's really cool to see and important to see that uh, like clubs like Sotelli and so on um, that we uh, have taken some inspiration from the last year that they are always in the lead. Or they are always in it. Um, maybe with some weaker guys, and you think that they won't be in the lead. But as you, when you are in the lead, you're just getting a flow in the flow, and that was maybe some of the tactic that we wanted to do as well, just to secure that we were not, maybe not like in the lead, in the lead, but like not uh, very much behind. And then the third leg was like a really or yeah pretty long uh, leg to beat Timila and it was um forked so 75 minutes of forked uh, orienteering on the night in Timila that could be yeah uh make some really big uh, time gaps but so we put Rasmus Anderson there um famous for uh, the long night in Ninesham uh, four years ago uh, for those who remembers that um and he did a really good uh, leg I would say but I think it was maybe smaller um, time gaps between the groups that than expected on that, that leg. Um, uh, yeah, and then I was running the fourth leg uh, before the long night, um, and my my uh, yeah uh, my uh, plan or my they I my. Um, uh, task was to not like fuck up <laughs> I would say it was not important that I <laughs> was in the lead or something but it was like do not uh, be 10 in, ten minutes behind be like 2-3 minutes and you have done your job and that was really important to me uh, <laughs> to know that it wasn't like I had to overperform or something it was just uh, doing uh, the things that I've, I've done uh, uh, earlier this season um, and I guess if you want, I can take some more details about my race uh, later. But um, and then the long night we had Lucas, and I think Lucas is maybe a little underrated uh, in, in maybe S- Sweden. Uh, I would say he was ninth at the World Cup overall last year, um, and he's a really strong guy. Uh, but I think that maybe people don't uh, actually knew that he was so strong um but we we really felt that okay lucas um 100 minutes in that kind of terrain is uh, you can't get any better than that and uh, uh, on the night middle distance leg we had like uh, oscar sjöberg who have been training for this uh, the whole year he has been injured but uh, he he had been uh, yeah, focusing on the sixth leg like for a year, I would say now. And then we will maybe like uh, taking more a risk on the seventh and eighth leg uh, that people maybe thought that we were putting Milos uh, on the seventh and Anjanings Bonek on the eighth leg. Um, but we felt like, yeah, as we said, that we could, uh, we, were, we wanted to secure a little in the, in the beginning. And we also felt like the eighth leg, um, that it was an fork that we could, that we didn't need to have the best guys on the team there. So we had like uh, Rasmus Meliès, who is a really strong runner, um, and we thought that okay, uh, unforked seven kilometers, uh, it's starting to be daylight. That's not the place that maybe Yanis or Milos are gonna uh, get most of their level out. Um, so, and, and and we could see that in Ed as well that Casper Foster was running that leg, and but he just gained two minutes uh, on us on that leg, 
uh, so it wasn't like really decisive in the end. And then, uh, like every other team in the top, we had like the the two best guys on the on the ninth and tenth leg, and we also had like uh, they have the routine. They have done this a lot of times, and and that was like Lucas maybe could have taken one of these spots as well, but he is also the guy who was best trained um, for a long night. Uh, it's a difference between running 70 minutes and, and 100 minutes. So I think that was the reason that Lucas got the long night and not like the last leg that he had on Nukola, for example. Yeah, that's fascinating. And uh, yeah, so- sounds pretty smart. Smells so it sounds uh, well reasoned to me. When did you hit the lead? Uh, we did hit the lead well, for uh, the first for the first time. I th- yeah, I don't know if it was. Uh, you may have hit the lead earlier on. on. I didn't notice, but you hit the lead, lead t- towards the end. Uh, on the long night, we had the lead. Uh, I was uh, changing over to Lucas, uh, two minutes something behind the lead, and then um, the lead was like some of the guys in the in the lead was waiting for some other guys and then another pack was doing a mistake on the second control so uh, we had the lead uh, already after 15 minutes on the long night and that was the first time we were in the lead and then we was a little more behind for some for some legs and then we was catching up the lead again on the night leg i think so uh alvin went out um with, with the lead on that last leg? Yeah, um, Luca did a really, really good job on, on the ninth leg. He was uh, heading out uh, 30 seconds behind uh, on the ninth leg, and then he catch EFK, they were running together. Uh, you can see on the on the television that he's uh, running really, really fast, and he's... I don't think he did any mistakes. He had, like, some... Uh, yeah, some uh, smaller... Uh, routes that could have been better but he was doing really really well and in the end uh, Alvin had a gap of uh, I think two and a half minutes or something and that was really important because you want uh, you want two and a half minutes on Gustav Bergman in in the beginning of May <laughs> yeah that pressure must have been um, immense for Alvin uh, obviously he has done this for many years and can't handle that pressure, but yeah, I, I can't imagine what it's like to have uh, runners like Gustav um, breathing down your neck for, for that mm. long and to, to not let it distract you, uh, to not to not just be, you know, like looking behind you at the wrong time and uh, miss a few knolls and find yourself running backwards and <laughs> then you'll be, then you'll, then it'll catch you. So mm. yeah, that's incredible. Um, I'm, I'm keen to take a closer look at your leg. Um, especially if you've got uh, the map up on your computer. Um, yeah. Maybe you've got live yeah, blocks or something. I, I the... think you can share your screen. This terrain, is is this uh, typical for this area? Have you uh, done, did you want to characterize uh, this terrain for us? Because I think for some of the international listeners or the, the non-Northern um, European listeners, a lot of the Swedish terrain kind of looks quite quite similar but there are some key differences mm. um just to look at the fish, especially with the, the shapes of the contours uh, as to what the difference are so uh, how would you describe this terrain and have you done many competitions in this area before um yeah uh i can start with that we were here on two camps uh, before team Mila. uh one in the beginning of december and one in uh yeah um the end of uh, Mars uh, slash beginning of April um, but in the beginning of December it was like a lot of snow um, so we didn't get like that kind of feeling of the terrain um, but uh, yeah, we, we got like to see how the terrain was uh, and how the map was looking and so on but you didn't get really the feeling of where it was fastest to run and so on um, but in in the last camp we had, uh, we got like a more more and better feeling of uh, of how the terrain was. Uh, we were doing training maps uh, like just 
two uh, between two and fifteen kilometers away from this terrain, um, and the whole area is called the uh, Shieldsbergen, and it's like uh, it's like uh, famous for being really tough and pretty hilly, I would say, and also um, they have a lot of. Uh, yeah, it's it's uh, many kind of terrains uh, on one map, I would say, uh, and you can also see that as well on this map. That uh, is very, yeah, uh, different uh, types of orienteering uh, that uh, we as a runner are meeting uh, during uh, the relay, um, and also the yeah, SM well, let's take a look relay. At those, those first. Yeah, but also the SM relay yep, yep, uh, was uh, on. going here in uh, in uh, 2017 so some of the guys on the rear team have been, been running here yep yeah those for those first two controls you can see the uh, quite quite vague slopes mm. the, the, the contours are generally not very detailed which is um, quite interesting going going into it full speed uh, at night time yep but uh, a and, lot of tracks. We were so, really yeah. in... so there's the ski ski trails in that earlier. So this is the a ski center. It's based at, at a ski center. By the looks of looks of it. Yeah, yeah. And we were really nervous about if they're going to use the slope uh, farther to the to the east here uh, at, at, uh, for the first control. If they were doing like 14 there at the night, um, I guess it would be even more mistakes. But I think in the end that. That wasn't used because that had been too extreme. Uh, maybe uh, it's important to remember that Team Eli is not like, or it's an athlete uh, relay, but it's also 200 teams of uh, more non-athlete runners. Um, so you always have to keep that in mind as well. Um, well, well, I'll let you yeah, um, uh, t- take us through the course as as you see it. Yeah, uh, I can. Will you? You want me to start the GPS as well, or just take us around the course? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think your your GPS will, will help help see how you make the decisions, yeah. and um, it's also it's also not clear uh, for those who haven't been to this terrain how tough the uh, the white areas are. And and so yeah. seeing uh, well, how, what the route choices are, uh, yeah, is, is quite quite helpful. Yeah, and uh, it's also uh, important to say that uh, I guess the terrain has been uh, even tougher if it's gonna be like in the middle of the summer. Uh, this year the snow was being there for just three weeks before the relay, so it wasn't like so tough that it could have been if the snow was <laughs> away um, earlier. Um, but here you see. Uh, so the, this the is that's an control. undergrowth thing. Is that is that yeah. right, Oscar? The, the uh, for the long the longer since the snow has melted, the more the bushes have uh, grown up, and so it's tougher to run. Exactly. I guess if if someone are going here in in the end of the summer or the beginning of the fall uh, there and trying to run the Timila. Uh, Coursers, they would uh, get a tougher experience than we got this year because the snow was here uh, just three weeks before, and it was still uh, snow in the slopes uh, actually. So uh, uh, yeah, the the growth hasn't been so high uh, uh, at this time of the year. Um, yeah, and uh, I was heading out uh, on. Seventh, seventh place, I think. Uh, but it was two teams that were having like two minutes gap, and then there was a bigger gap. Um, and the first control was pretty easy control, I would say. Not, uh, yeah, uh, not that uh, hard. Uh, like, um, I'm here like a blue one uh, doing with uh, Ravinen and Stura Tuna. Um, I don't think you're seeing my uh, my uh, or it, I don't think you're seeing Linnea uh, because I'm under there. But uh, yeah, you see here already that I'm in the lead of the pack on the road here, and I didn't realize that I was 
I guess I was already on the second spot here, um, but I didn't realize that. And like almost in the lead actually here. Um, and then I think I can pause it a little because here is like forked with four different controls. Um, so it's really hard. And I thought that I was doing, um, oh yeah, I still think that I was doing a safe, um, a safe um, route choice here, and I was running with some of the other teams, and I ha I had the C control, um, and then we can see what's happening next because uh, yeah, that's I think the commentators on the TV didn't catch this actually. Uh, so here you see that I'm first on the B control, and then I think I relocate and getting stone, and that's oh, it's the wrong code. And then I can relocate and get the C control. Um, so that was really, really stressful. And um, yeah, um, I thought that I was um, having. I knew that I where I were when I was heading the control, and then I was maybe a little too eager to follow the other guys and went to the B control. And, and, and when I saw the B control, I was thinking I was like on the cliff, uh, Thorder, um, a little south of the my stone. I don't know if you see where I, I'm pointing, but yeah, I uh, can see your cursor. So yeah, just just above the Intenui for mm. uh, those who are looking. Um, yeah. So yeah, very very close to the control. So you probably weren't quite so concerned until you bumped into the B control and then you're starting to get quite stressed. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, um, no, no, I got a spot in the top, uh, or the first team of Linné and I feel prepared and I no knew that I was, <laughs> was supposed to do it. And then I like fucking up, up already to the second control. And I was like, Oh, Oh, Oh. And then, and then I was, um, calling behind my right shoulder and this guy with the camera was standing there filming me and I was like oh 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 so th that was uh, really really tough uh, and then I thought that I was relocating and and I was like okay there's a stone oh it's a reflex nice and then I came to the A control and it's like okay it's the wrong code again and the, still the cameraman uh, was behind me and I think uh, my heart rate was. Uh, <laughs> I think that it was the highest heart rate I had on the whole leg, actually. Uh, but th then I could relocate and get my control. And then I was like, I was taking five seconds on um, my second control uh, then, uh, just to ju uh, just to get focus again. And okay, I've done my two minutes. Uh, we knew that someone are gonna do two minutes, but it's important that it's just gonna be two minutes and not five minutes. Or it's easy when you're um, doing a mistake in the beginning that you're doing a new mistake on the next control and get stressed and so on. So it was really important for me that okay, now you just have to start over again and and do the job um, from here uh, and towards the finish and. Yeah, I think I could do that pretty well. We can um, see. Yeah, that, that's that's really happens. impressive to to recover from a mistake like that under, under pressure. Uh, that's such an important point that that you've made that someone is going to make a mistake. Okay, it's me today. Let's just make sure it's not a five minute mistake, and let's take yeah. some time. Just burn it. Burn another five seconds. Okay, so it was, it was two minutes. Now the mistake's two minutes and five seconds. But at least I'm slightly more relaxed going into the second leg. A bit calmer. I'm not going to make... If you make two mistakes in a row, then oh, it's going to be so hard to to get your head back. So, yeah, that, that's really, really impressive that you've um, managed to recover your brain uh, after, yeah, after that. And, and I think the preparation we did was important. Uh, like, I felt like in my head I had run this leg like 100 times. Um, so I had thought about that this can happen and when it happened I felt like okay but I know how to handle it and I think that was really important because if I have handled it wrong I, it could have been like more mistakes and we could have been like six minutes behind on the long night and then I don't think uh, we've been winning the relay 
Um, but you're seeing that I'm doing my job um, after this mistake. Um, and but but in my mind, I was thinking, okay, I'm maybe running for 20, 25 spot now, and. I was also feeling like, okay, maybe the lead is like five minutes in front of me, but um, actually I was like on the seventh place and still just two minutes behind. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, not uh, so easy to know when you're running out there. And then here it's you have this really fourth area um, that was fought with all the four legs before, before the long night. Um, and you can see that this is, uh, yeah, uh, hard, really hard on the night. Um, yeah, maybe and we I can also zoom catch... in um, a, a little bit further. Yeah. Do you see it better now? Uh, so it's, uh, the yeah, 7 control was beautiful terrain. Control. Yeah, really cool terrain here. Um, like, <coughs> on the beginning it was more like this big, big slope, but here it's more like, uh, flatter area with uh, yeah uh, more difficult orienteering I would say uh, and especially at the night and you also had like these smaller green areas um, that show that the visibility uh, was uh, pretty dense in uh, in this area um, and also that the forking was like so into each other uh, made us made that it was lamps everywhere crossing each other so it was really hard to to know where you or the guys other guys were going but also where you wanted to go when people were running uh, everywhere in the forest actually um so yeah here i did a oh i did a little, little mistake on the, i had the m uh, forking i think so i did a little mistake on the ninth control as we can see later on i was running for a path here um, actually I should have taken the path uh, earlier like color one is doing so you are you are in the middle there uh, just uh, behind Mora yeah the uh, again, again, again you have the, the Linnea gets covered every time unfortunately yeah but, um, yeah and there I did a little mistake um, I was I thought that I was really um, like okay I'm on the top of the hill now I'm I was standing there for like two seconds and like, okay, now I have my direction. Uh, but actually I was like more south than I was thinking. And I, yeah, um, did see the stone. Uh, I didn't see that it was a control on the stone, but I see the control. Uh, now I, I saw the stone uh, and then I was just running to my control. Uh, so it was, it was not that big mistake and I didn't stress up um, anything of, of that mistake. It was like maybe 30 seconds, but... Uh, but the group was uh, running past me then, so I didn't get this group with, as you see, like uh, Anthony and Urien and this kind kind of teams. So I was running all by my own, uh, all by myself, uh, for like almost the whole relay, I would say. Uh, from the second control, I was alone, and then the pack was catching me, but then it was so forked that I was alone again, and yeah. Um, and then you're seeing just the last couple of legs I was, uh, yeah, as I was running maybe a little alone, they were running, uh, a little faster, uh, the group there. Um, but that was also because I didn't want to take any risk, uh, especially after the mistake on the second control, it was important for me to, to keep it together, uh, all the way to the finish. And when I was sprinting down to the 14th control, I was like, okay. I can be five minutes behind, I can be two minutes behind, I don't know. Uh, but it was a really good feeling when uh, they were screaming at me on the last control and saying that I was just two minutes behind and I was, yeah, uh, sprinting to get Luke, uh, yeah, uh, early away on the long night. And it was also important to get some gaps on the teams behind because the teams behind or every team knew that we had Luke, so it was like one of these trains that could be going on the long night. So um, it was actually a cool feeling when I was out there that it felt like people was really looking uh, where I was running because they wanted to uh, see where Linnea was. Uh, and 
wanted to to be out there every little on that night. Yeah, oh, so that was uh, that, yeah, that's a really tough uh, really tough course at, with such high pressure uh, at night time. Can nope. you um, share some insights into how your orienteering is different at night time compared to during the day? What do you find you have to change the most? Uh, I'm really running more more secure. Um, I'm a runner that want to run secure in the daytime as well, I think, because it's, yeah, um, it's easier to don't do mistakes, but um, on the nighttime and especially on the relay, uh, you're doing is as safe as possible. Like, take this uh, second control, for example, that maybe on daytime uh, you will do a straight uh, route choice, just running on the compass through the more white and green area, and you can also just run uh, towards the hill and maybe get some cliffs or something like that um, into your control. But on the night, uh, you want uh, it's not so easy to see, uh, so you want to be as close to the control uh, as possible and still uh, know 100% where you are. Um, so I like I have a tactic like if I okay now I know that I may be losing 30, 40 even 50 seconds on this route choice, but I'm 50% more secure that I'm gonna not gonna do a mistake on this control. I I'm doing that uh, route choice because uh, I think it's a good investment um, when you're doing uh, relay running and especially yeah, especially in a relay yeah night plus relay like just don't lose that's your job just don't don't lose yeah um, cool. well, that, that, yeah that was a really yeah. cool rundown and i hope people really appreciate uh, seeing the map uh, and yeah. yes how you handle some of like the, the good times uh and, and the bad times out there so yeah yeah th th thanks for sharing that thanks so what's next? Oh, what else is coming up? That, that's like a massive victory to uh, start the season. I'm sure everyone's stoked at the, the, the team, especially, but um, people like uh, Mas Frang, who's dedicating a lot of time uh, mm. to the club, must feel like they've, they've been rewarded as well. So mm. uh, is Yukala now a big target? Does that make you the, the, the favorite for, for Yukala? What next? Um yeah uh it's differs a little between those who are uh trying to get to walk and those who are more like me and running uh, or are not good enough to run at the walk and and will maybe do more more relay specific trainings but um yeah yukla is the big now uh, for the club um and yeah i guess we are kind of favorites on Nukola, but it's also important to remember that teams like Sturituna, who have maybe seven really good guys and not the three last spots on, like, Team Miller uh, team, it's not, maybe that, uh, not that good, and that are, and they have won, like, the last two years, and also the Finnish teams are always really good in Nukola, and it's like, Team Mila, it's the thing we're talking about the whole winter, and they're now that we are starting to focus um, on the Yukula, I would say. Um, and it's also um, hard this year, I would say, because the book is like just a week after Yukula, uh, so it's hard to know who are running and who are not running uh, for a lot of teams and also for Linné. Um, like, we still don't know if some of the guys are making it to the book and so on. And if some of them are making it to the walk, uh, they may be not running Yukula. And if if they are not making walk, they are running Yukula. Um, so, and I guess that's uh, a thing for most of the top teams with with walk runners, um, with Swiss runners. With uh, yeah, um, so it's gonna be yeah uh, interesting to see uh, the lineups uh, on Yukula on the top teams. I would say. 
Cool. And yep. one last little thing before we go, um, any, any tips or promotion for uh, O-Ringen coming up? Yeah, uh, come to O-Ringen. Um, the terrain in, in Uppsala is really good. Uh, Lundsen, uh, I would say it's the best terrain you can run in. Um, and I think it's going to be, be really, really cool. Um, and Lundsen and Nossen, they're, they're where we have made our our trainings to win the team Mila and uh, now we can uh, try this uh, woods as well and uh, yeah it's just uh, pure uh, orienteering I would say um, really really nice orienteering experience that uh, uh, orienteering are offering uh, uh, or ringings is offering this year oh well, yeah I'm looking forward to it so hey if you if you're there um, say hi uh, yeah, it'd be, be great to get back into that terrain. And yeah, I don't know how I'm going to handle a long race in in Lundsen, just having to stay so concentrated uh, for that length of time. I think that's, I think I've maybe I've done like a 17 minute training in Lundsen before and like, like no tracks, just like every little hill the whole time. Mm. Um, it's quite different to, to like doing a lot of the walk long distance races where there's a lot of track running sometimes and you can, rest your brain for a few minutes and then get back into it. But it's going to be something else uh, doing such intense terrain with very few tracks. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see exactly what part they use. I'm not quite sure, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Pretty much the whole Lucen is embargoed. And yeah, I think it's going to be a really uh, testing concentration because you, you can never relax in Lunsen. Uh, that's my tip. Keep the map yeah. contact. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, thanks, Oscar. It was great to talk, and congrats again to yourself and, and the team for what's a, a massive, uh, massive win at Team Miller. So, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. If you're enjoying the Perfect Flow podcast and want more value from it in the future, there are some ways you can support it. The first is to rate or leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or other platforms where it's available. The second is to share this podcast or specific episodes on social media or with friends. The third is to get involved more directly through the Perfect Flow page on Facebook, where I'm trying to construct a more interactive community. I want Perfect Flow to belong to the listeners, and if you tell me what topics you're most interested in, or even suggest specific guests, I'll do my best to make it happen. This is your opportunity to be part of something that answers your questions and adds value to your life. Another good reason to follow Perfect Flow on Facebook is that I post links to episodes, blog posts, and anything I find useful to this page. It's a great way to follow my training, racing, and learning. Another great way to stay engaged is to subscribe to genebeverage.nz. This way you will get podcasts and blogs emailed to you, avoiding the clutter of Facebook. I don't know where this project will take us, but the reception so far has been positive. Who knows where we might be in a few years.